Hey kiddos, welcome back to Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. We are starting off today with part one of chapter 13. Part one of chapter 13, we are starting on page 197. I plunge to my death. We spent two days on the Amtrak train. Heading west through hills over rivers past amber waves of grain, we weren't attacked once, but I didn't relax. I felt that we were traveling around in a display case, being watched from above and maybe from below, that something was waiting for the right opportunity. I tried to keep a low profile because my name and picture were splattered over the front pages of several East Coast newspapers. The Trenton Register News showed a photo taken by a tourist as I got off the Greyhound bus. I had a wild look in my eyes. My sword was a metallic blur in my hands. It might have been a baseball bat or a lacrosse stick. The picture's caption read, 12-year-old Percy Jackson wanted for questioning in the Long Island disappearance of his mother two weeks ago. is shown here fleeing from the bus where he accosted several elderly female passengers. The bus, the bus exploded on an East Coast, New Jersey roadside shortly after Jackson fled the scene. Based on eyewitness accounts, police believe the boy may be traveling with two teenage accomplices. His stepfather, Gabe Ugliano, has offered a cash reward for information leading to his capture. Don't worry, Annabeth told me. Mortal police could never find us, but she didn't sound so sure. The rest of the day I spent alternative, alternately pacing the length of the train because I had a really hard time sitting still or looking out the windows. Once I spotted a family of centaurs galloping across a wheat field, bows at the ready as they hunted lunch. The little boy centaur who was about the size of a second grader or a pony caught my eye and waved. I looked around the passenger car, but nobody else had noticed. The adult writers all had their faces buried in laptop computers or magazines. Another time, toward evening, I saw something huge moving through the woods. I could have sworn it was a lion, except that lions don't live wild in America, and this thing was the size of a hummer. Its fur glinted gold in the evening light, then it leaped through the trees and was gone. Our reward money for returning Glodolia the poodle had only been enough to purchase tickets as far as Denver. We couldn't get berths in the sleeper car, so we dozed in our seats. My neck got stiff. I tried not to drool in my sleep since Annabeth was sitting right next to me. Grover kept snoring and bleeding and waking me up. Once he shuffled around and his fake foot fell off, Annabeth and I had to stick it back on before any of the other passengers noticed. So, Annabeth asked me, once we've gotten Grover's sneakers readjusted, who wants your help? What do you mean? When you were asleep just now, you mumbled, I won't help you. Who were you dreaming about? I was reluctant to say anything. It was the second time I dreamed about the evil voice from the pit, but it bothered me so much I finally told her. Annabeth was quiet for a long time. It doesn't sound like Hades. He always appears on a black throne and he never laughs. He offered my mother in trade. Who else could do that? I guess he meant... Help me rise from the underworld if he wants war with the Olympians. But why ask you to bring him the Master Bolt? He already has it. I shook my head, wishing I knew the answer. I thought about what Grover had told me, that the Furies on the bus seemed to have been looking for something. Where is it? Where? Maybe Grover sensed my emotions. He snorted in his sleep, muttered something about vegetables, and turned his head. Annabeth readjusted his cap so it covered his horns. Percy, you can't barter with Hades. You know that, right? He's deceitful, heartless, and greedy. I don't care if his kindly ones weren't as aggressive this time. This time, I asked? You mean you've run into them before? Her hand crept up to her neckline. She fingered a glazed white bead painted with the image of a pine tree, one of her clay end-of-summer tokens. Let's just say... I've got no love for the Lord of the Dead. You can't be tempted to make a deal for your mom. What would you do if it was your dad? That's easy, she said. I'd leave him, or rot. leave him to rot. You're not serious. Annabeth's gray eyes fixed on me. 
She wore the same expression she'd worn in the woods at camp the moment she drew her sword against the hellhound. My dad's resented me since the day I was born, Percy, she said. He never wanted a baby. When he got me, he asked Athena to take me back and brace me on Olympus because he was too busy with his work. She wasn't happy about that. She told him heroes had to be raised by their mortal parent. But how? I mean, I guess you weren't born in a hospital. I appeared on my father's doorstep in a golden cradle carried down from Olympus by Zephyr the West Wind. You'd think my dad would remember that as a miracle, right? Like maybe he'd take some digital photos or something, but he always talked about my arrival as if it were the most inconvenient thing that had ever happened to him. When I was five, he got married and totally forgot about Athena. He got a regular mortal wife and had two regular mortal kids and tried to pretend I didn't exist. I stared out the train window. The lights of a sleeping town were drifting by. I wanted to make Annabeth feel better, but I didn't know how. My mom married a really awful guy, I told her. Grover said she did it to protect me, to hide me in the scent of the human family. Maybe that's what your dad was thinking. Annabeth kept worrying at her necklace. She was pinching the gold college ring that hung with the beads. It occurred to me that the ring must be her father's. I wondered why she wore it if she hated them so much. He doesn't care about me, she said. His wife... My stepmom treated me like a freak. She wouldn't let me play with her children. My dad went along with her. Whenever something dangerous happened, you know, something with monsters, they would both look at me resentfully. Like, how dare you put our family at risk? Finally, I took the hint. I wasn't wanted. I ran away. How old were you? Same age as when I started camp. Seven. But you couldn't have gotten all the way to Half Blood Hill by yourself. Not alone, no. Athena watched over me, guided me toward help, made a couple of unexpected friends who took care of me for a short time anyway. I wanted to ask what happened, but Annabeth seemed lost in sad memories. So I listened to the sound of Grover snoring and gazed out the train windows as the dark fields of Ohio raced by. Toward the end of our second day on the train, June 13th, eight days before the summer solstice, we passed through some golden hills and over the Mississippi River into St. Louis. Annabeth craned her neck to see the gateway arch, which looked to me like a huge shopping bag handle stuck on the city. I want to do that, she sighed. What, I said. Build something like that. You ever see the Parthenon, Percy? Only in pictures. Someday I'm going to see it in person. I'm going to build the greatest monument to the gods ever. Something that'll last a thousand years, I laughed. You, an architect? I don't know why, but I found it funny. Just the idea of Annabeth trying to sit quietly and draw all day. Her cheeks flushed. Yes, an architect. Athena expects her children to create things, not just tear them down. Like a certain god of earthquakes, I could mention. I watched the churning brown water of the Mississippi below. Sorry, Annabeth said. That was mean. Can we work together a little, I pleaded. I mean, didn't Athena and Poseidon ever cooperate? Annabeth had to think about it. I guess, chariot, she said tentatively. My mom invented it, but Poseidon created horses out of the crest of waves. So they had to work together to make it complete. Then we can cooperate too, right? We rode into the city, Annabeth watching as the arch disappeared behind a hotel. I suppose, she said at last. We pulled into the Amtrak station downtown. The intercom told us we'd have a three-hour layover before departing for Denver. Grover stretched before he was even fully awake. He said, food. Come on, go boy, Annabeth said. Sightseeing. Sightseeing? The gateway arch, she said. This may be my only chance to ride to the top. Are you coming or not? Grover and I exchanged looks. I wanted to say no, but I figured that if Annabeth was going, we couldn't very well let her go alone. Grover shrugged, as long as there's a snack bar without monsters. The arch was about a mile from the train station. Late in the day, the lines to get in weren't that long. We threaded our way through the underground museum, looking at covered wagons and other junk from the 1800s. It wasn't all that thrilling, but Annabeth kept telling us interesting facts about how the arch was built, and Grover kept passing me jelly beans. So I was okay. I kept looking around, though. 
at the other people in line. You smell anything, I murmured to Grover. He took his nose out of the jelly bean bag long enough to sniff. Underground, he said distastefully. Underground air always smells like monsters. Probably doesn't mean anything. But something felt wrong to me. I had a feeling we shouldn't be here. Guys, I said, you know the god's symbol of power? Unabeth had been in the middle of reading about the construction equipment used to build the arch, but she looked over. Yeah? Well, hey, the... Grover cleared his throat. We're in a public place. You mean our friend downstairs? Um, right, I said. Our friend way downstairs. Doesn't he have a hat like Annabeth's? You mean the Helm of Darkness, Annabeth said? Yeah, that's his symbol of power. I saw it next to his seat during the winter solstice to council meeting. He was there, I asked. She nodded. It's the only time he's allowed to visit Olympus, the darkest day of the year. But his helm is a lot more powerful than my invisibility hat, if what I've heard is true. It allows him to become darkness, Grover confirmed. He can melt into shadow or pass through walls. He can't be touched or seen or heard. And he can radiate fear so intense it can drive you insane or stop your heart. Why do you think all rational creatures fear the dark? But then, how do we know he's not here right now? Watching us, I asked. Annabeth and Grover exchanged looks. We don't, Grover said. And that is where we stop today. We will finish the rest of chapter 13 tomorrow.